If it's all right with everyone here, we'd like to get started. That will be all right. First of all, I'd like to say hello. I'm Barbara Judge, and I'm very fortunate to have been elected as chairman of the IOD. It's a real privilege and an honor to be your chairman, and it's very gratifying to see so many people here at the annual meeting. Thank you very much for giving me this honor and this privilege. I'd also like to, to pay a tribute to Ian Dormer, who is here and who was chairman for much of the year, and has done a tremendous job. I know Ian for a long time, and I know that we were all, as members of the IOD, extremely fortunate to have him as our chair. And thank you from, on behalf of all of us for all the good work that you did and will hopefully will continue to do with us. It's a pleasure to see you, Ian. This is the 2015 AGM. And it's very interesting because this is the first time in the history of the IOD the AGM will be streamed live on the internet. Members who were unable to attend physically will now have an opportunity to join us online. So welcome to all those members who are here online. Loretta Levy, who I think most of you know, is the Institute Secretary, and she will give us a brief overview of how this will affect our schedule today. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Um, the main difference with today's uh, voting will be it'll be slightly slower, so if you can all just um, bear with me. For those of you who have iPads here in the room, the voting will appear on your screen, and uh, please vote either for or against or abstain. Um, if you're voting from your computer at home, and um, we've got a slight 15-second delay, but you'll still have um, the same message appear on your computer. Um, so there will be a slight delay, um, so if everyone can just bear with us. Thank you. Okay, before we start the formal business of the meeting, Simon Walker, our Director General, who I think all of you know, will give us a short overview of where we are today. Right. Well, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, we've had a number of discussions via LinkedIn and on email uh, in regard to the AGM and the annual report uh, regarding the general performance of the IOD. I just want to say it's been a useful debate, and we welcome that continuing. We've also had useful discussions on Chartered Director, uh, and Barbara hosted a discussion with the Chartered Directors last Monday. Um, if I can turn to uh, the year more broadly, we've had a positive year. It's been a year of huge change and a year of investment in the future and of redirection of the Institute. Um, the climate is challenging, and, and, and we believe change is required, Many of the things that we're doing now are matters that we perhaps should have moved on some years ago, but as I mentioned to Council in our previous session, there's an African proverb that says that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, the second best time is today. So we're planting some, some trees. Uh, membership is in positive territory, um, and that's the first time since the turn of the century. We've actually been in chronic decline uh, over the last 15 years. This month, we will again have a positive member number, meaning that seven out of the last nine months will have been positive. Now, that incorporates the fact that we have the IOD 99 aimed at young startups and entrepreneurs, uh, but we are making a real difference here. One of the quotes that, uh, that we've also cited uh, is from an American uh, change leader, is if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. So we're really operating on the premise that we need major changes. We're investing in making our services better for the future, in modernizing this building, our headquarters in, in Pall Mall, in giving up, as you'll be aware, the other building at 123 Pall Mall, We've established a partnership with Regus, giving our members access to 300 British and global locations. Uh, and we've invested in the regions, giving heads of business development to a number of regions. And we intend to extend that program to increase membership locally. All of that has contributed to the planned deficit, uh, and I stress that it was planned, of 1.1 uh, million pounds. And I believe that sets the ground for substantial 
future savings, uh, this year we're projecting a surplus of one million pounds, and we're currently at 200,000 pounds ahead of budget at the moment. I wouldn't be too optimistic about that, but I am, uh, I am confident that we can, can reach the projected surplus. Uh, we are having a continuing emphasis on uh, professional development and on the governance side uh, of the IOD, and the Chartered Director Program remains at the heart of our offering and continues to be the pinnacle of achievement in terms of IOD uh, qualifications, and we intend to add effort into that. As you'll be aware, Roger Barker uh, undertook a review uh, of the Chartered Director Programme uh, last year. Louise, um, Louise Gallivar, our new Head of Professional Development, uh, is implementing that. Um, the Good Governance Index, which is a major exercise to emphasize that that, that, that is the core of what we're offering, uh, the first major event took place two weeks ago with very significant uh, media coverage, and I believe this is stressing that, that, that's, that that's key to what we're doing. Internationally, we are being uh, modestly active in a number of arenas. In ECADA, the European Confederation of Directors Associations, uh, which we started and where we continue to play an active role representing director interests in this country at European Commission level, but also in the global network of directors' institutes, which is 16 um, partner organizations around the world, including a number of IOD affiliates where we are taking a, a, a leading role. Indeed, I am uh, the, the, the global vice chair at the moment. Um, press and media coverage, I mean, the, the shorthand way to say how we've been doing is that this year we measure every month uh, where we are in terms of newspaper and television and radio coverage. Um, we have this year, uh, throughout the year, outperformed the CBI. Uh, we were always ahead of the smaller business organizations, the manufacturers and the, the FSB, but it is only um, over the last uh, seven or eight months that we have started overtaking the CBI in terms of actual media coverage. And that is, uh, and great credit goes to James Broll and the policy unit on this, that is a hell of an achievement. Um, we have 14 people in our policy unit. The CBI has over 120 so we're very heavily outgunned, and the fact that we're punching that much above our weight is significant. And that's included several meetings at number 10, including with the Prime Minister, which a number of you here today uh, attended, meetings just a couple of weeks ago with the Chancellor, the Business Secretary. There is every indication that we're going to have a greater influence with the present government uh, than we had with its coalition predecessor, but I'd also stress, and I'd stress it publicly here to all of you, that I want to work with the Labour Party in opposition to try and develop a more business-friendly and understanding approach than they went into the last election with, and that will be a particular focus of mine, and I should say that the opposition uh, senior figures I've talked to about that absolutely welcome that. Uh, Europe, we're expecting to play a major role in the debate uh, ahead of the referendum. Um, and, and I expect that to be a major kind of business agenda in broad terms uh, uh, over, the next, over the next year. There's been a significant review of the constitutional aspects of the IOD. I see Chris Parkhouse at the back, who of course was at the heart of the 12 meetings that it took to come up with the, the new constitution. That is being put to the meeting today and then will be sent to the Privy Council where we believe it will be supported. Um, our new chair, Lady Barbara Judge, uh, I particularly welcome on behalf of the staff of the IOD. Uh, she's had an extraordinary business career since she was uh, the youngest ever SEC commissioner in the States and, and only the second woman and she's worked in Asia. United States and, and in this country. And I think that reflects the globalism and breadth of the IOD. Her priorities, women and diversity, younger people start, start up an early stage business agenda, and the transfer of business skills from older, more experienced people to younger people in their business careers are very much mine and the IODs. And I think we're 
really punching uh, ahead of our, uh, above our weight as an organization. On Friday, the Duke of York was here uh, speaking to a, a major event of, of black leaders who were talking about business prospects here and setting up here. In the afternoon, we, we hoisted the uh, rainbow flag ahead of uh, the Gay Pride March uh, over the weekend outside, which again uh, was very well received. Initiatives we've taken, like Lord Brown speaking here on that topic, like our Mental Health in the Workplace <coughs> initiative, like IOD student branches, uh, which are now starting to place uh, member IOD students, and I see its architect in, in, in the third row, um, are starting to place them in jobs, uh, particularly in the regions. Uh, these are things I'm immensely proud of, as well as things like our annual convention the Women in Business Conference, and the quality of the team and staff that we have within this organization, but always remembering that our ultimate dependency is on the individual members, and particularly the volunteers, many of whom are in this room today, and most of you are in that category, uh, on whose efforts uh, the IOD depends. Thank you. Solomon, thank you very much for that very extensive extensive review of our activities and priorities in a short time. We do have microphones if anybody would like to ask a question. If there are no questions, ah, there is, ah, Martin, how are you? Uh, Martin Barrow, um, Simon. It would be interesting to hear, you, you wrote an excellent piece that was published about immigration and separation of data with students, encouraging an open UK. It'd be interesting to hear from you how that is progressing and whether that's something that you're raising in all your ministerial meetings, because it's absolutely critical that we keep the door open in all the categories of visitors, students, and inward investors. And I hope the IOD will continue to take a very active stand on that subject. Well, well. Thank you, thank you very much, Martin. Um, look, it absolutely is an area we intend to be extremely active on. Uh, and the reason we're active on it is because we survey our members. Most of you will be members of Policy Voice, and we know exactly what they think, which is that we need the input of those people in our business community. But heavens, I'm sure we also need them in thing, areas like the NHS um, as well. So it's, it's an area where we have disagreed with the present government and continue to disagree with it and to put our point strongly. At the moment, my particular concern is the proposed changes to the Tier 2 uh, visas, uh, which are, are extremely threatening to a, a great many businesses in this country. Uh, we, I was reading the draft submission to the uh, select committee that's hearing representations on that, which the IOD will be formally putting in, uh, asking for those criteria not to be tightened. Um, we welcome uh, skilled migrants, particularly to this country. We greatly fear that the government's inability to control uh, people coming in from Europe has meant that they're far too aggressive in stopping bright and able people from Commonwealth countries and from the world in general. And that is damaging uh, our members. And I would say it's damaging the IOD. We have also been in situations where we haven't been able to give jobs to people Who's, who would have benefited us had we been able to take them on our staff. Well said. Are there any other questions? All right. If there, if there are no other questions, then we'll go on to the, minute, to the meeting in general. Now, as we've said before, this streaming that we are doing it for the first time will give us some delays. So we will hope that you will bear with us on these matters. The first item is the minutes. The minutes have been available on the website, as we said in the notice of annual meeting. Simon's overview covered a majority of the items which needed to be updated. May I have your approval for the minutes? May I have all members who joined us online to submit their votes on resolution one, approval of the minutes now. The annual report and accounts have been available on the website as per the notice. I just want them to know that the professionals are here to count the numbers. 
You'll have to tell me because I can't see when we are available. So just while we're waiting for the vote to come in, it's just worth saying that um, the result that we get is a combination of everyone in the room, everyone online at the moment, and also our proxy votes um, and the votes that we had in advance. Um, uh, we had 140 or so um, votes in advance of the meeting. So who's going to say the numbers? Um, this gentleman's going to say when. Okay. It's 183 for... But who would announce it? If you announce it. Okay. Yeah. So have we, have we finished all the voting? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, I'm happy to say that with respect to the minutes, 183 votes have come in for. Actually, there's, there are 11 abstentions. There you are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the annual report and accounts have been available on the website in accordance with the AGM. Eddie Finch, who's our auditor from Cut. Tim Lawler, who's the chairman of the Audit and Risk Committee, and Nick Cowley, who's our finance director, are all available for technical finance questions. Can I invite any questions on the annual report and the accounts? Okay. Yes, sir. I think we have a, a microphone for you. Hello. Ian Hargrave, uh, at the risk of being slightly pedantic, uh, I just want to draw attention that on uh, page 19, talking about employment costs, uh, the statement is made that there was a reduction in the number of employees, which explains why uh, the overall cost increase is mitigated by an increase in salaries. Elsewhere, we've the report says that the salaries remained the same and there was only a change in bonus. And on page 27, the full-time equivalent number of employees has actually increased, not decreased, which contradicts the earlier statement. Is it possible to have some clarification on that, please? Where is the finance director? Nick is just over here. Oh, there you are. Nick, do you want to answer that question? Um, hello, sorry, I'm Nick Cowdy, Finance Director. Um, it's um, a good point you raised, I must admit. Um, so, I mean, I, uh, the, the number of employees in the employee note is basically flat. I mean, it's 285 versus 283. And um, the, the narrative uh, does refer to a slightly reduced number, so the, there is a, a slight mismatch there. But um, so the, the overall number of employees is, is flat. Um, rather than a slightly reduced number. That's all I can say, really. Is there anything else to be said on that? All right. Are there any other questions on the annual report and accounts? Excellent. All right. May I ask if you are happy to receive and consider the annual report and accounts for 2014? May I have all members who join us online please submit your vote on the resolution two and approve, which is the approval of the annual report and accounts. Now, please, can everybody vote who hasn't already voted? Oh, we can't say them. Can I say that? No. Yep, we're good to go. Okay. We can now see that the votes are 199 for 
acceptance of the annual report and accounts, four against, and 11 abstentions. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the recommendation of the reappointment of Buzzacott, our accountants, for 2014. Must be 2015. It should be. Yes, yes I said, it should be 2015. May I ask for the approval of Buzzacott's reappointment? May I have all members who have joined us online to submit their votes on Resolution 3, which is the re approval of the reappointment of the accountants for the year coming 2015. Is everybody voting at this moment? Are we ready? Yeah. No. no, we're not ready. There's one or two more to come in. Okay. Good. All right. The results of the voting was 181 votes in favor of the reappointment of Buzzacott, one against, 13. and 13 abstentions. Okay, next. The next item on the agenda is the election of four members to council. Allison Howard, David Trenchard, Chris Parkinson, and Philip War. Parkhouse. Parkhouse, sorry, I can't read my own writing. Uh, each one went through the reappointment process via the nominations committee and the overview of council. All of the appointments were made in line with the Constitution. Allison, David, Chris, and Philip. May I ask you to leave the room for a moment? <laughs> the Institute Secretary Loretto is available for any technical questions with respect to the appointment process. Are there any questions ahead of the time of this formal vote? Sir. Oh, hello, Michael. How are you? Um, Michael Large. Uh, I am a former member of the board, having been its first vice chairman from 2003, I think, to 2007. And I, I actually chaired uh, a number of uh, committees. So whilst I know Alison, and I'm delighted to see that uh, you've reappointed her or suggested her reappointment. Could you just give me some clarity about the, how you've arrived at the calculation of her years served? Because when I was um, on the board, uh, she was a very active member of the membership committee and prior to that she'd already been chairman of Kent, so I'm sure that uh, uh, you will have a reason, but I'd like to hear, please. <coughs> Loretta? Yep, absolutely. Um, thank you for asking the question, Michael. Um, the way we calculate um, our terms of office is, is to combine the terms on council and board, and, and that's been um, built into the new constitution. So we applied the same um, technical approach to this appointment. So um, Alison was part of council when she was a Kent uh, chair, um, and that was, um, I don't have the exact figure on me, but that was in the in the... Uh, early 2000s to 2004 time. Um, then she stepped away from council for some time, um, but was an active part of the membership committee um, and is now also on the audit and risk committee. Um, and it was only recently she came back onto council. So her entire time in council so far has been six years, um, and therefore she's eligible for another three year appointment. Sir. to actually uh, tell the members who these people are. Some of them may know who they are, and some I'm, sh I'm sure they're all very distinguished, but it would be nice to know who they are, what they've done. That's a very good point. Loretta? Um, we did have some data included within the, um, the AGM notice. Um, 
Uh, I'll try and do my best, a uh, best summary. Um, Alison Howard is an accountant. Uh, she um, focuses mainly on um, academies. Um, as I mentioned, she's been quite a strong supporter of the IOD, both in membership committee as well as audit and risk committee. Um, do an order. David Trenchard went through a full um, open recruitment process. Um, that was the process that we advertised last year. Um, David's background, Simon, is... He um, was vice chairman of Knight Vinky, which is an activist investor and has a, a long-standing background in, in the shareholder rights and corporate governance area. Um, that's, that's his background, basically. Good. Um, Chris... Uh, Chris Parkhouse is um, a marketeer and runs a business um, which is both international and nationally based. Um, and then finally we have Philip War, who is a surveyor. Um, he has set up uh, uh, his own uh, firm which is listed, which is PH War Limited. Um, so that's a very uh, quick summary of, of the four candidates. Um, but we'll make sure for next year that we'll have a, a, a much longer explanation and maybe an extended CV of each candidate. Are there any other questions? If there are no other questions, may I take a vote on the approval of these appointments? Our first vote is for Alison Howard. May I have all members and those who've joined us online submit their votes for resolution for the reappointment of Alison Howard. Can you vote, please? All right. The results are 182 for the reappointment of Alison Howard, four against, and 22 abstentions. The second resolution is the appointment of David Trenchard. May I have all members online as well as here voting for resolution five, the appointment of David Trenchard. Okay, are we here? Uh, three. Oh, are we, are we here? <laughs> yeah. All right, 172 for the appointment of David Trenchard, six against, and 20 abstentions. Okay, the next vote is for Chris Parkhouse. May I have the vote of all the members here and online for the vote of Resolution 6, Chris Parkhouse. Are we here? <coughs> Excellent. Okay. For Chris Parkhouse, appointed as a council member, 171 for, four against, and 21 abstentions. The final appointment vote is for Philip War. May I have all the votes both here and online, please, for resolution six? The appointment of Philip, reappointment of Philip War. Appointment. Is that done? Yeah. 
Okay, the final vote is 167 for the appointment of Philip Orr, mm -hmm. six against, and 23 abstentions. Therefore, all four of them have been appointed, and thank you very much for your patience in this voting. Could you ask them to return, please? The next item on the agenda is the approval and adoption of the revised bylaws and the member regulations, which have been available on the website as per the notice of the AGM. Congratulations, gentlemen and lady. You are all appointed. We look forward to active service. Back to the approval and adoption of the revised bylaws and member regulations, which have been available on the website in accordance with the notice of AGM. The Institute Secretary is available for any technical questions regarding the revised documents. Are there any questions ahead of their formal vote? I'd like to pay tribute to Loretto at this moment and to the committee that worked on these documents. Revising these bylaws and the governing documents of the Institute of Directors is a monumental job. And they worked extremely hard and extremely efficiently, efficiently to bring them into the modern era. And it seems to me that it's appropriate to thank Loretto and her team as we vote for these new amendments. Are there any questions? Michael. Uh, yes, I apologize for having a second go at the cherry, as it were. But I have two, two questions in relation to uh, the bylaws. Um, first of all, my, my history with the Constitution was chairing the previous Constitution subcommittee back in the uh, early 2000s when we came up with the first new Constitution since 1903. Uh, and that um, came through in 2003. And at that time, we uh, went extensively to the branch network to get members' opinions canvassed. And uh, some years ago, some three or four years ago, in fact, uh, when a serious amendment to the Constitution was made, I did ask at an AGM here, though unfortunately it wasn't minuted, whether the increase in term of the Director General uh, from five years to seven years was something that had been widely consulted on. I was told it hadn't been, but it would be. It wasn't. And the resolution subsequently, as we know, became uh, ingrained in the bylaws. So I am concerned to know how well this has been consulted upon whether it has gone to the branches, what the branches have done, whether they've interrogated their members. I understand there's been availability to uh, view these on the, on the website, but only a small proportion of the members actually do. And I'd just like to follow up that question with, with another small detailed point, and it refers really back to a point I raised earlier about lengths of service and how they're calculated. And I think... It, we need to be very careful how we apportion uh, the time served to uh, some of the, uh, or in fact to all, of members uh, applying for office. I think if we applied it strictly, uh, uh, we'd be a bit troubled to uh, look at quite a few of the appointments that have been made. Um, in fact, the former chairman um, would have uh, probably broken some of the rules um, albeit that most of those uh, breaches would have occurred before the rules came into play. So I would like to be sure that we can make, that we can make a, an arrangement within the bylaws such that uh, a branch chairman can attain the position of a regional chairman, can attain the position of a board member, and can attain the position of the chairman of this board without breaching any regulations. In other words, that we make sure that those people who have been uh, 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 honored within the institute in the positions they hold are not disbarred from uh, applying for the chairmanship by virtue of their time served. I hope that is, <coughs> that is clear. Thank you. Shall I answer both? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your questions, Michael. Um, the first question was about uh, engagement and consultation 
um, we actually started the consultation on the principles that we were putting in place in the constitution in January and we extensively consulted and uh, came up with our proposal with the board and council. Uh, we then also went out to the committees. Um, so for a full month, we consulted with each of the committees um, and got quite a good feedback, quite a lot of feedback from them, which was then fed into the Constitution and Governance Reform Group, where there were some amendments made to the proposals. Um, only at that point did we go out to the members um, but we did go to the members for a three-week consultation, and during that period, we were available on LinkedIn um, for discussions. We had specific live LinkedIn sessions as well as webinars. Um, and then finally, uh, once we approved, the Board and Council um, took on, on board the member feedback. Um, we approved the, the, the updated governing documents, um, and uh, those governing documents were placed on the website um, for three weeks before they were actually published in the AGM. So it was quite an extensive um, consultation exercise and probably um, well, one that hasn't been done previously in the IOD, but one of the key things, um, as you will have seen as part of our new constitution, is that we actively encourage and will act actively be involved um, and lead in consulting at the appropriate level on major changes to the constitution as well as strategy. So that was the first question. The second question was about length of service. And um, built into the constitution is a new rule. It says that you can only serve on board and council for six years. Um, you can serve an additional three years in exceptional circumstances. Um, and we have specifically made a policy decision that that does not include committee, um, committee positions. So therefore, a branch chair would be able to become a regional chair, then a board member, and a council member once they sit within the six-year six rule with a three-year three three exceptional rule on top of that. Thank you, Loretto. Are there any further questions? All right. May I take a vote for the approval and adoption of the revised bylaws? May I have, do you want to do the bylaws and the regulations separately? Uh, yes, we have to because of the Oh, computer. okay. Sorry about that. Because of the computer, we have two votes where we might otherwise have one. Can we take a vote on the approval and adoption of the revised bylaws? May I have all members who have joined us online submit their votes now on Resolution 8? While well, we're just waiting on the, um, on the results to come true, once the bylaws are approved at, at the AGM, they then need to go to the... Um, bear with a second. So while we're waiting for the vote to appear, um, it just, it's, quite, it's worth noting that the bylaws need to go to the Privy Council for approval, um, and that will happen during the month of July. So we hope at the end of July to be able to announce to the members that we have new governing, governing documents in place. Can we ask you to speak up a bit, because you're a little bit indistinct at the side oh. of the room. Apologies. So I was just saying that the, the, the bylaws need to go to the Privy Council. The Privy Council then approve them and they become um, or governing documents along with the Charter. Um, what sits in behind that is the member regulations and the board regulations and they will all become active on the date that the bylaws become active. Thank you. Okay. Do we have the vote on this? We have 160, oh, 175. Just, yeah, there's a few more people because it didn't come up straight away. Uh, all right. I think it's 183. Is that it? Keep getting more and more here. 183. Excellent. 183 for the proposed governing documents. Four. Four against and 14 abstentions. Now we have a vote to approve the member regulations. May we please start the online voting? Oh, it's all on the screen. So, yeah. I didn't see that. That one's on the screen. Okay. Michael Lodge's going to go nuts when we talk about these transitional arrangements. You watch. <laughs> okay, are we here? Uh, just about. We've got another two minutes just to allow the people at home to vote. I can't read it. Has everyone got it on their iPads? No. Not yet. No,
We're doing very well to only have a technical hitch at vote nine. <laughs> so if you just bear with us um, for a few minutes. My experience is that technology never works when you want it to. <laughs> never. Oh, it's working. <laughs> okay. For the member regulations. There's a few more coming oh, then now they keep voting. Yeah. This is a very popular one. <laughs> I can't see this one. Uh, one eight, eight, one eight, nine. One eight, nine. It is a very popular one. Yeah. One ninety. Yeah. It's like a horse race. <laughs> Okay, 194, the member regulations, four against, and 11 abstentions. Excellent. Okay, may we now move on to the proposed approval of the proposed 12-month transitional arrangements to enable the compliance to the appointment aspects of the new constitutional framework. The Institute Secretary is available for any technical questions regarding appointment processes. Are there any questions ahead of the formal vote on this motion? All right. May the voting begin. Yeah. I think it'd be after 90. Because that was the last one. Yeah, 188? No. Okay. 188. All right. The final vote is 188 for, four against, and 10 abstentions. Excellent. Okay. All of the proposals that have been put before the meeting have now been formally approved. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for being here. I understand this is quite a lot of people here compared to the years prior, which means that we are getting more member engagement, which is very important. I'd also like to thank Simon, Loretto, and all of the executives and all of the non-executives and the council members who have worked very hard to make the IOD such an important institution. And as you heard from Simon, it is on an uptick. We're looking forward to having that uptick go even farther. And to the extent that anyone in this room can be helpful, can drive membership, can give us good advice, we're looking forward to engaging with you, our members, because it is, after all, the Institute of Directors. So thank you very much again. There is actually a buffet supper in the Trafalgar Room for those of you that would like to stay and have a cup of coffee, drink, or some food with us. But once again, let me thank you very much. And for my own personal position, it is an honor and a pleasure to be the chairman of the IOD. 112 years we've been in existence, the most important business organization in this country members who have made tremendous contributions to the growth <laughs> and economy of the UK over many, many years. Thank you all for putting me in the position to try to serve you. Thank you. <laughs>